Well, good afternoon. My name is Mitch Weisberg. I'm here with EdChat Interactive. And today we have a really, uh, I hope, uh, a really interesting uh, conversation, designing and using games to change behavior. And a lot of people, a lot of you are here because you're, uh, you came through the Serious Play Conference. Uh, Michael is a featured speaker at Serious Play. Uh, they have uh, a lot of really interesting topics on using games in K-12 education, using games in higher ed, using games in corporate, military, government. Um, a lot of the uses of games are, to edu are in education or to educate people, um, but games can also be used to, f to really uh, change people's behavior, and that's uh, uh, Michael's uh, specialty. So um, just w let you know that we have other sessions that are coming up. Uh, this is our last session in May. This has been a whirlwind, uh, designing and using games to modify behavior. But we have one, two, three, four, five games coming up in June. And then we'll probably have a July and August schedule as well. So you can go to edchatinteractive.org if you'd like to and register for any of the sessions that we have coming up. So I'm going to stop my share. And Michael is the co-host or, or the host, the main speaker, the, the big cheese, the main event. Uh, why don't you get this puppy started? All right. Uh, hey, everybody. Thanks for, for coming. Welcome to my very humble living room here in, uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. This is very strange. I've never done anything like this, uh, quite like this before. I've done lots of talks, but never from my living room and a yeah, computer. But uh, so, so bear with me here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen and jump right into it. But I want to encourage, um, Mitch has, uh, has offered very graciously to moderate and field questions, but I, I very much, I prefer my talks are discussions. Uh, what I don't want to do is talk endlessly about something no one cares about, um, which could possibly happen from time to time. So please, uh, put your questions in chat and Mitch will, uh, uh, get that to me accordingly. Um, awesome. Well, I'm gonna start right in here with, with a slide, um, little slide deck. So designing, <laughs> designing games to change behavior. It's, uh, I wanna be very overt up front. This is not a magic bullet. Um, there is no uh, magical one way to do this. This is the way that I've learned over the last decade. Um, there we go. Um, so I have, I have deep roots at UW-Madison. Um, I want to also be clear that, so I am not an academic. Um, I work with a lot of academics. I have no uh, higher ed degree. I have a bachelor's degree in uh, game development. Uh, but I've spent a lot of time around a lot of, a lot of really cool people, which I'll get into in just a little bit. So I'm, I lean much more toward the academic route, but I'm, I'm a game designer. Um, so, so who am I? <laughs> I, uh, I designed my first game at eight years old. Um, I used to, uh, at a very young age, I liked Dungeons and Dragons. Um, a lot of my friends did not. So I ended up combining, I did some kit bashing and before I knew what that was and combined the game Sorry with Dungeons and Dragons. Made the possibilities much more uh, controlled. Um, so then I started on an art pathway, you know, after high school, uh, but I rejected, rejected the idea of college. So I, so I went in the Marine Corps and I'm sharing this with you uh, <laughs> this this history because I have a pretty unusual path and I saw that a lot of people were were interested in uh, how I got to where I am. Um, so here's some some pictures of me. Um, I was in a special operations capable unit in the Marines for about 11 years. Um, not not the typical path you see for most game designers but uh, it was it was my path. Um, so I've, I've learned a lot of different things over the years, a lot of different skills. Um, above all, really, really teamwork. Um, and after, after the Marines, I, I did a lot of different things. Uh, I became a contract artist. I was even a FedEx courier at one point. I was a cabinet maker for Estee Lauder and Lancome. Um, so I've done a lot of different things, but then I finally decided to go to a local technical school and I got a degree in digital media. Um, and then suddenly everything changed. <laughs> so you know, I don't know if it was the, the school itself or, or what exactly happened, but for, for those of you, any of you just getting started in your careers, um, you've probably heard this before, but try to find a way to do what you really want to do. Um, it's been working out for me. <laughs> um, 
while I was in school at this, at this local little tech school, some of you may have heard of it. Um, it's, it's called a uh, Herzing university, very small. I wouldn't say it was a, a great experience academically, but I, I was able to meet some really great people. Um, on my own, I built a game called word striker that was designed to, to help third graders learn vocabulary, had some, some neighbor kids and got along with them. I was, I was getting into this, I did this student project. Um, but I ended up working with school teachers, eventually the school board, the principals, parents, students. Um, this caught the attention of some of the UW faculty <laughs> in the area who are also working with a lot of these same groups, uh, namely uh, Kurt Squire, Rich Halverson, Constant Stein Cooler. Uh, so in about 2009, uh, they offered me a position at GLS to be their first real game designer um, through this work, uh, given that I had already been well, working with schools and at, at the time, I thought I had sort of cornered this market and figured out a way to use games for learning. I didn't realize there was this giant field that Jim G and others helped build. But uh, also in the school, and I think it's really important, something that, that makes gear learning what it is, is uh, Greg Vaughn and Jake Roosh were fellow students of mine there. Greg is now our chief technologist and manages all of our technology and, and is the architect for all of our games. And uh, Jake is our UI UX artist and art director. Um, so I've been working with these two for about about 12 years. Um, our, our team is much larger than that, but those two specifically. Um, so so my trajectory uh, in the in the space of game based learning. So I, like I said, I, I started in 2009 with a Games Learning Society, which was really the Mortgage Institute for Research. It's who was paying the checks um, or writing the checks rather. Then in uh, 2012 to, to 2016, we sort of merged with MIT's um, uh, Media Lab, Education Arcade, uh, with Eric Klopfer and Scott Osterweil and folks. We still had our studio here in Madison, but we did ran all of our contracts and did a lot of design work and stuff with, with those. So, so my network of these, of these people, is, it's been fantastical. Um, and then in uh, 2017, uh, or actually it was a fall of 2016, uh, the Dean of the School of Education here at the University of Wisconsin asked me to to start up a, a group in the School of Education. Uh, so we, we broke off from LGN and started Gear Learning. Um, and Gear Learning, like I said, is in the, uh, is in the School of Education. We, we operate out of the School of Education. We're all academic staff. Um, so all of our contracts and stuff go to the uni university, but I'll, I can say more about that in a little bit. Um, So just to give you an idea, some, some of my background that I, I do know a little bit about what I'm, what I'm going to talk about here today. So from just at the Morgan Institute for Research and GLS, um, you know, I've, you know, worked a lot in a uh, lot, lot in games, specifically stuff going on at the Discovery Institute, which was virulent to give me about virology. Pathfinder came on to be Fair Play, uh, Trails Forward, uh, and then Progenitor X, a, uh, <laughs> a zombie game about stem cells. Uh, then at play in the cosmos, some of you may know um, a game called Zoodles out of uh, Taiwan, uh, Econauts, Oztok, Crystal Zicador, uh, and then 2017. You know, you can see many more. So I've I've built uh, roughly 33 games um, over my over my tenure. But uh, let's let's jump right into uh, game design. So I. Mitch shared with me some of the things that uh, people really wanted to see in this talk, and it was really all over the place. So I'm going to try to hit a, hit a little bit of each, each uh, um, sort of specific point, point where people are interested. And for those of you just joining, please, please ask questions, interrupt if, if I'm talking about something that you have particular interest in, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, but so what does it mean to design a learning game? Uh, you'll probably get, you know, a hundred different answers. Um, but uh, to me, the role of a learning game designer is to, is to work with the scientists, the subject, subject matter experts, the, the business folks, any stakeholders, and use my knowledge of gameplay mechanics and map those mechanics to specific learning objectives. Um, it may sound easy, and sometimes it's really fun, but it's, it's actually incredibly difficult. And one of my favorite things about this is is the challenge itself. And I've well, I've had the opportunity to work some work with some really really amazing people. Um, and as, as you develop games, are they all uh, digital games, or there was one of the questions: is some of them tabletop games? Um, so, 
So I've built a number of tabletop games, card games, things like that. Um, physical games, analog games, whatever you want to call them. But uh, most of the games I've done in the last decade are digital games, video games. But those games almost always start out as board games. I'm a big fan of paper prototyping. Um, I like to sort of see how everything, everything works on paper before you really you know, start spending you know, months and months in coding. Um, does, does that answer the, the question? I can get into that a little more if you like. Yeah, no, that, that answers the question. And to me, it makes a lot of sense to design the game first so that you can rapidly iterate that, rapidly iterate it. Because if you start off by coding a game, it becomes a lot more difficult to make changes <laughs> after you get some experience with players. It does. More difficult and, and expensive. Uh, so we work primarily with um, external partners as far as uh, sort of funding. Um, we've got a lot of fantastic partnerships, McGraw-Hill Education, uh, W.W. W. Norton, we're working on projects and, you know, these, these games are, are quite expensive. And so it's really important for the, you know, return on investment for this, for this whole model to work, that we're efficient. And so I, I, that's why I firmly believe that paper prototyping, even if it's just drawing, whiteboard prototyping, whatever it is, but days, sometimes weeks in that phase can end up saving you, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in development. Um, but so, so getting back into just a little bit about, about the role. So, so a, an astronomer, a cosmologist named Adam Frank from the University of Rochester actually got me really thinking. It's something I believe, but I hadn't really been able to put it into words, but he was saying that he wanted the rules of astronomy and the at play in the cosmos game to be the rules of the gameplay itself. And while, while I, I do believe in that, I hadn't realized that you could, in, in some instances, literally do that. Um, and so this, uh, that's been a thing that I've been really thinking about over the last like, you know, four or five years um, when, when Adam would talk about that really getting, really taking that to heart. And uh, it, it, it can impact your, at least it's impacted my thinking. Um, I've worked in a lot of complex content areas, areas where you, you may not necessarily think gameplay is, <laughs> uh, well, could be done. You know, virology, regenerative medicine, pretty easy, but getting into the space, uh, we'll see in a little bit, I worked on a, a really exciting project called Chris is a K-Door with uh, Richie Davidson. He's a cognitive neuroscientist and getting into pro-social behaviors and empathic accuracy. That was really where I first really started getting interested in behavior change. Um, but, you know, electrical engineering, um, you know, human development, embodied cognition, I mean, with, with geometry, gosh, there's so many amazing things I've been, I've been a part of. It's just, I feel incredibly lucky. Um, but we'll get to see a, a few of these here coming up. Um, so the University of Wisconsin, I've, I've talked to um, lots of different schools um, all over the country. And, you know, everybody has some interest usually in, in some sort of, you know, game design, game-based learning, something like that. But University of Wisconsin has a game development studio. Um, it's very different than, you know, shell studios like you, you guys set up out, at, uh, out in Pennsylvania and all that. But uh, our, our, our structures in the School of Education, specifically because game-based learning and, and education technology needs information. So as we're researching, as we're learning what works, you, you can't just do this with, um, you know, a commercial game. You can't just uh, get under the hood in, a, in any, any popular game or even an external game to the university and just open it up, tag data, pull data, report data, um, change, change minor things. And so uh, we've known for a long time back, back when I worked very closely with, uh, with Kurt Squire and Constant Stein Cooler that, to really understand what's happening in a game, to understand the learning, to see what's working, what isn't, you really need to build them from the ground up. Um, so those are those are two really really big reasons why the why the School of Education is 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 funding a, a massive game development studio. Um, beyond game design, there are other big 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 things that impact the, the entire process. So data analytics and reporting, knowing what's useful and what isn't useful and who it's useful to, whether it's at the researcher level, the teacher level, the player level, being able to break it down into cohorts really, really matters. Um, I'm a little nervous about a lot of the, the data analytics that are starting to come out in games and the things that we're claiming to know. Um, 
being on the inside of this, it, it's just, I just want to make sure that we move slowly and we, we move correctly and we don't start integrating, you know, PII, student data, student history, you know, demographics with, you know, gameplay. There, there's still, there's a whole bunch of missing pieces to the puzzle. So it's been making me a little nervous, but we need to be aware of all this stuff as a designer. Um, LMS integration, learning management systems. Uh, more and more, we're seeing our games being used for grades and for credit. Uh, not just did you play the game or not, but games being assigned. Um, games being used as homework and reported through different LMSs, usually through some sort of LTI integration, but uh, this is happening. Um, and then also the use cases. So I, could, I can design the best game in the universe, um, but if it's not implemented correctly, if it's not used correctly, it's, it's not gonna work. And so keeping in mind how you want the game to even be used uh, matters quite a bit here. Uh, but we'll, we'll get into that in just a little, little bit later. Um, very specifically, now I am not a psychologist. I am not, uh, I, don't, I don't study this exclusively. So what, what you're gonna see here, this behavior change sort of, sort of model is what I've come to understand um, to work. Uh, so if you take any current behavior, doesn't matter what it is, doesn't matter if you're talking about pharmaceuticals or uh, you know, anger problem, any, any sort of behavior, any, doesn't matter. Um, I've come to, to learn that, you know, you have a current behavior, there are some barriers to change. Um, you know, you can look at probably 500 different, different models or frameworks and they're all kind of the same to some degree. But uh, then eventually at the end of the day, you want movement towards some sort of desired behavior. And so the barriers are where I kind of try to focus and I figure out, you know, what barriers can games really impact? Um, having a lack of time, lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding, not being engaged, or, you know, even a lack of confidence that, you know, behavior change is possible. Those are the areas where I think that we can impact with games. Uh, well, I, I know we can. Um, so if you, if you push the um, current behavior and the desired behavior off, off to the sides here for a minute and look at, you know, those barriers to change. So if you have a, a lack of time, you know, a well-designed game, ideally players can play at their own pace. Um, if I want to go through and explore the game and I want to take my time, that's how I can play. If I want to blast through the game as fast as possible and beat my friend, it's up to me. Um, you know, that matters. Um, knowledge. So, so as I've been working with different, um, different experts, different scientists and faculties, I've come to learn that sometimes it's just simply a lack of knowledge where, you know, a, a, a behavior that's, you know, not necessarily desired, but that, that's sort of the impetus there. Um, so learning through the gameplay can really be important and understanding what you're learning. And I do think knowledge and understanding are two very different things, at least in this context. But uh, when you're playing through a game, some of the things that are, they're, they're kind of tricky to learn. And so this experiential understanding I've seen both kids and adults come away from gameplay, you know, understanding what I would think would be fairly common, you know, understanding how, how pollution might move or what causes pollution, for example. Um, you know, I've seen grown adults play in the gameplay and, and have these aha moments. Um, you know, so, you know, if that's a barrier, I, you know, I, I know games can, can impact that space. Um, also engagement. Um, <laughs> To some degree, we're all being told what to do, what we can and can't do, especially lately. Um, and so, uh, you know, engagement, something that's fun, something I want to do, it matters, it matters a lot. And there was an interesting comment in the chat also that, uh, you know, basically something changes when a game becomes assigned. You know, you, you just talked about agency a second ago. It's no longer complete. It's no longer the, the same type of agency when, when, a game has been assigned, right? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, so that, that can be true. Um, whoops, I think I've skipped ahead here. That can be true, uh, depending on the age group. But, but I've, I've seen a lot of really powerful instances where you can, you know, for, for example, um, at the, the game app play in the Cosmos, I sat into their uh, uh, the University of Wisconsin's Astronomy 101 class. 
And in that class, you know, they, they we're talking about, a, you know, class size of two to 300 students. And, you know, they're maybe there for what they, <laughs> what they may think is a, an easy A or they may just, you know, it, it's a, we're, we're talking about a non-science major elective here. Um, real lack of interest. And then suddenly the, the instructors who have, who have come to know them pretty well pull a video game up on the screen, a link to load that video game. The students load the video game. I mean, you, you can feel it in the room. You know, it's assigned, it's homework. They know this is going to get piped right into the LMS and they're going to get a grade on this. They're all over it. it. You know, not only is it new, but they can kind of control it. And then it becomes this, this really interesting dialogue between the instructor and the student all through this, the game, then the game becomes less of a game, more of a conduit uh, to some degree. But, you know, being, being assigned something can certainly have a turnoff. I mean, we don't, you know, I don't always like to be told what to do, but I also do have an understanding. I think it's important to understand that you do sometimes have to do things you don't want to do, but um, yeah, it's just, it's not necessarily, I think games can actually break through that space. Um, games assigned as homework. Um, gosh, if we had three hours, I could show you all different kinds of instances here, but um, we're even starting to see through some, some of our other projects um, an increase in homework completion rates because some of them are game-based. Um, even, even really complex stuff like you know, human lifespan development, different, different things like that. People are actually more engaged um, and so they're actually willing to do more, it seems like. Um, but the, these studies are gonna be ongoing for years and years. Um, but I can tell you from, from inside and under the hood that, that there's some really exciting things starting to happen. Um, and then getting- And when you say can, uh, can play at their own pace, of course, if um, in an individual game, you can of course play at your own pace. Uh, but if you're in a group game to a certain extent, things are happening with it to everybody at the same time. So, so, so uh, but, but that's also a matter of choice because you've cho you're, you're participating as part of a group and you don't want to slow the group down. Yeah. And, and the playing at your own pace that you think, thanks for bringing that up. And we clarify that a little bit. So there are obviously lots of different types of games, you know, multiplayer, synchronous, asynchronous, um, the types of games I'm talking about right now that they're sort of being assigned, well, they're not sort of, they're literally being assigned as homework or as assignments. Um, the students can log in and play when they want. If they want to play at midnight, I guess if they're, you know, if they were talking about younger kids, that may not be ideal. But if you're talking about adults, if you're talking about people who may work part-time jobs, you know, students, these are, you can, you can play when you want. Um, you, your progress is saved. So it, you know, time becomes less of a barrier here. And we're, we're actually, when, in looking at even some of the initial data, we're seeing people playing at all different times a day. You know, you could assign up, you know, homework, you know, you can see people sort of uh, procrastinating. You'll see, you know, all these big, these big spikes in, in homework turn-ins, uh, you know, as you get closer toward the deadline. But the, the times, you may see 3 a.m., 4 a.m., you know, noon. You just, you know, hopefully students aren't playing in, at least in school, other classes and whatnot. But uh, now it's the, the playing at their own pace um, can, all, can mean time that they're playing in the day. And then also if I, if I, do, if I choose to, you know, like I'd mentioned before, you know, try to complete the game as soon as possible, or if I want to explore, or if I want to play with the game a little bit, try to break it, try to, you know, there are those types out there. I am one. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, so, so time, knowledge, you know, understanding, engagement, confidence, you know, lack of any of those things, can, they can be barriers that the games can pretty impact pretty, pretty well. Um, and the confidence part, through some of the other games, I've, I've been seeing sort of uh, the game can demonstrate sort of a modeling of the desired behavior. And, and for a lot of people, adults, children, uh, it doesn't seem to matter too much, but seeing it unfold, even if it's digital, even if it's a cartoon style, it makes it more attainable, it seems like. Um, but uh, all of these things, um, all of these things matter. Um, the game itself, like I said at the onset of this, in, in designing a game, um, like some of the ones I'm gonna show you, they're not a magic bullet. They don't just operate in a vacuum and suddenly everything is, is different because you had this experience. I've seen tremendous breakthroughs in discussion groups. 
um, meaning a facilitated discussion by an expert of what players experienced in the game. Um, the fair play game, which we'll, which we'll look at in a little more detail coming up, it's a game about implicit bias. You know, it talks about things like bigotry and racism and, you know, these you know, very charged, um, very charged topics. But by play, playing this game and then having a, you know, 20, to, 20 minutes to an hour discussion afterwards, you see that even though, even in one experience, you know, this is, it's a, it's a designed experience. There's a linear gameplay that we've, we designed. People can take different things away from that. Um, and so being able to discuss that really, really matters. Um, and I, I love, I love being a fly on the wall in those rooms and listening to what, what people are discussing. Cause and sometimes I'm, I'm blown away. They're, they're getting deeper things than what I intended or sometimes, sometimes you can miss the mark. Um, but it's very informative. Very, it's just a wonderful experience. Um, and then group play. Um, you can run it sort of like, like think alouds where you have one person controlling a game, you know, two people. This works particularly well with, uh, with kids, but um, you, can, you can get a lot of discussion going as decisions are being made amongst the, this very small group uh, during gameplay. So that, that can be really, really helpful. Um, and like I mentioned in the, in the big astronomy class, having an instructor playing an astronomy game, piloting this spaceship out of, in the universe, while students are playing along in parallel, boy, that's impactful. You know, I can, in that moment when the instructor hits the button, you know, I hit the button, maybe it, it dawns on me that I don't know why we hit that button. I can ask. I now have this, there's now this, this context that wasn't there before that can lead to just, just amazing, amazing instruction. Um, Wonderful, but but the game itself is not the is not this standalone magic thing you, you throw at someone and they're different. Um, that's that's not that that's actually terrifying to me. Um, we need people. We need we need other interventions. Uh, I want to make sure that's super super clear. Um, so we're going to look at at these four games today. Um, they're they're all very different. Um, we worked with different sets and even different types of experts on each of these different games. And so I'll go through those and, and talk about those relationships and talk about how and why we got to where we did um, with each of these games. So we're going to look at Econauts, which is about ecological science, uh, Fair Play, which is about implicit bias, um, Crystals of Cador, which is about, uh, well, it's cognitive neuroscience, but it's, it's empathic accuracy and pro-social behavior. And then, uh, uh, MedSmart Adventures in in Pharma City, which is about uh, medication safety. And are those games available that we could access them af afterwards, or are there links to them? Um, so th most of the games, these games are Fair Play is available, and I'll, I'll have a link to that. Uh, MedSmart is also available. There'll, there'll be a link to that where you, you can you can play. Um, but Econauts and Crystals of Cato are both locked down for research purposes. Um, I, I can get into to why, but Crystals of Cador became, it ended up being so effective, it became viewed as a medical intervention. And because it was a medical intervention, it has to go through all this crazy testing. And I, I know Richie was in conversations with the FDA, um, different things. So making sure that it, it didn't cause any harm uh, was, was, uh, causes this game to remain on a shelf uh, for right now. Um, and it, through, through Crystals of Cater, we also, we also learned that uh, um, some researchers were sort of conducting some just, just some experiments with in children with aut aut autistic spectrum disorder, autism spectrum disorder. And, and so that game ended up, I don't think any of the science or any of the research is out yet, but it being really impactful in that space. So it's just, it's really locked down. Um, so it's maybe even be harder than getting a COVID-19 test approved by the FDA, right? <laughs> Oh my God, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with no comment. Uh, right now, but, oh come on! <laughs> oh, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Um, uh, but then and Equinauts. Uh, so so often we'll, we'll build a game, um, and then that game may run out of funding. And so Equinauts is actually locked down due to a lack of funding on an old version that's no longer compliant, even even though it's only about five years old, with current technologies. Uh, so that game was designed specifically to run on a a version of a mobile tablet that uh, uh, well, it doesn't run anymore. 
Um, but we, we can get into those. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll have a, a link and stuff up um, after this or else you can feel free to contact me. Um, so some overarching questions. So if you're talking about behavior change and if that's, if that's sort of a, uh, you know, if that's a core tenet of what you're trying to accomplish with your game, you know, I always want to know, you know, are people willing to change? You know, why, why or why not? Why do they care? Because um, I, think, I think that matters. And so getting into really, really, really drilling into who the target audience starts to matter more and more. You know, a, a child, uh, you know, an eight-year-old is probably going to care about different things than a, than a high schooler. And a high schooler is going to care about different things than a, you know, a 30-year-old professional. Um, so, so that really, really starts to, to matter. You have to think about that all through the process. Um, you know, and then, and then honestly asking yourself in the, in a specific space, you know, being, being honest, can the game work here? You know, it's it, sometimes there are, there are spaces that I run into where we can't really find a good way to, to get to some of this stuff. Um, but you know, be honest with yourself um, through this process, whether it's from a business perspective, whether it's from a, a true behavior change perspective, but, and then figure out how can we measure this? How do we know if it's working? And there, uh, there, there are a lot of new ways that people are finding to, to get into this. Um, so let's, first let's take a look at Econauts. So Econox, what Econauts um, was done with the University of Wisconsin, a group called Y Science, and then the, the Mortgage Institute for Research has a big, uh, big outfit there. Um, two, two amazing scientists and, and faculty, uh, Robert Bohannon and then uh, uh, Michael Ferris um, kicked all of this off. And then this was originally also funded through, um, through, some, through some NSF grants. Um, and the idea was we wanted to teach middle school kids something about uh, pollution, pollution that they necessarily, couldn't necessarily see. Um, you know, we weren't talking about litter. We weren't talking about um, you know, smoke necessarily, but how, how pollution moves through, through ways that we can't see. Um, so we have the, this really rich environment, sort of a, at the time, sort of World of Warcraft inspired, inspired or this, this chunky artwork. It's in a tile-based system, and the players compete uh, for a financial goal uh, on purpose. We want them to try to be the first, uh, they, or you can com compete in, in teams of three, so it'll be so it's it's synchronous multiplayer and it's one v one v one, so you're you're in it for yourself. Your job is to reach this this uh, this financial goal of ten thousand dollars, and you can do it through choosing one of three industries, which is the the foresting industry, farming or agriculture, and then the uh, the steel industry. And so you you build buildings, you upgrade the buildings, you produce more things, but you have to you have to set these little units out in the environment. When you set them out in the environment, and we tried to model as closely as we could, uh, you know, given a very high, high level um, uh, tile based game for building a giant steel factory, it's cheaper and easier to run and maintain if it's near a source of water, uh, things like that. Now, if you do that, the offset is that you cause a lot of pollution. Um, so basically, the players are, are all playing, they race through this. Uh, uh, they race through this goal or race toward this goal and they destroy their environment. You have got pollution all over the place. You know, trees are dying, all kinds of, all kinds of problems. Um, then the, uh, the, the instructors take the kids out to the real world, out into the Sugar River, River Valley here near Madison. They interact with, you know, they do different experiments. They learn about these, these I think they're called Secchi discs. You measure the clarity of the water, doing all kinds of other tests. They come back into the lab. This is a, a summer program. Uh, they come back into the lab. They play the game. Most of the students, they play differently. Even if it's cheaper to put the factory by the water, they won't. They'll just move out of the way because they, they don't want to hurt the environment. And we, we can see these things happen through the data. We can also see these things happening in discussion with the instructors. Saying, you know, any, even starting to ask questions, well, why is it cheaper? Like, why, why can't I just, why can't I do these things? And so the students are given a certain set of constraints in the game. And as they're talking with the instructors of these summer camps, they're asking for ways to break the game and remodel it and change it so that, because they, they know what these, they, they've seen the, these physical sort of um, outcomes in the environment. They've, they've seen what can happen. So they're, it, it's a really interesting thing to see. Um, 
and so so the big design challenge was honestly so the pollution exists even if we can't see it we want, this is what we want players to take away and then why does it exist and then in that behavior change well what can we do about it um and now in this game, we weren't looking for individual behavior change necessarily. We weren't asking kids to recycle more. We weren't asking kids to not litter. Um, we were looking at a much larger scale. You know, if we, if we teach these things to middle school students now, when they become adults and they vote, you know, what sort of things will they, will they understand? So that was sort of our, sort of how we were trying to approach that. Um, and here you can see a couple other images where, on the image on the left there, you can see that it's, it's more effective to locate a factory, factory near a water source. Then you can also see the, in that tile-based format, lots of pollution. You're seeing some fish kills, some little fish skeletons and stuff there. Um, lots of problems are starting to happen. And, it's, and then it's on the, on the right there, I think you can see a, there's a couple of little farms starting to, to pop up. And before you know it, um, we used some, some really, really complicated modeling um, using, the, using the, local, uh, the local geography around here, showing that how this pollution in this little niche of this uh, this lake, this ecosystem, suddenly 20 miles downstream where these condos are, you have this rotten smell coming out of the water. You have you have other other problems that you you know you can't necessarily just see it happening. But um, it seems to me that there are certain people running the EPA who could possibly benefit from this game. Yeah, I you know I've done a couple of talks that we've we've demonstrated the game at the uh, uh, you know an Earth Day you know celebrations different things like that, but. Um, no, I, I think this one definitely has has merit, and I think that it could <laughs> it could go a long way toward teaching people that other than kids. Um, inevitably, when when the kids play, they talk about it. The parents start looking at it. Next thing you know, the the parents are, are learning things. So I I completely agree. <laughs> um, now, you know, modeling larger <laughs> economic implications and impacts. That's not what this game is about. Um, but I think that it, it is, the, the science is accurate. Uh, the pollution moves the way it moves. Um, and so it's, it, it, you can get past the, because it's a game, you know, the target audience can definitely be, be older. Um, the, uh, the, these large scale behaviors, um, we want kids to start to think about, you know, costs and benefits, economic choices, um, you know, the role of government, you know, to a degree. Um, and then thinking about long, long range planning. So like I said, we're not talking about an individual's behavior, but we are talking about thinking about society and being a member of society. You know, hopefully the kids that played this game, it's been a thousand or so, uh, know a little more. Um, um, any, any questions about, about that one specifically before we, before we move on? I, th I think the, the questions are more general about measuring the effects like these kids went through you know, these kids went through the games and then the, the, how do you know that um, they actually took actions later on that reduced the pollution that they were uh, the, that the, they would normally be causing yeah so so given the so it would take a longitudinal study of you know a decade or more uh, so we don't know in those terms uh, we do know you know, very short term in a, in a matter of days that we saw without, without being asked to change gameplay, students choosing to change gameplay. And, you know, with, with, with any game, with any activity, you know, uh, changing the behavior, we'll, we'll get into some of these, these, these other projects and, and how, how we know something is happening. Um, but a lot of this, a lot of, in this particular game, it was observation. It was watching students. It was interviews. It was, you know, asking if they understood. Um, but the game itself sort of puts the student in a place to, to see what they would do. And, and given that they, they did change gameplay uh, behaviors without being prompted, um, showed us a little something. Now, we're not coming out and saying that, you know, this is the, the solution to pollution and, and all that. That's a, that's a study that has yet to be done. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm probably guess this. I'm not watching the chat at all. I can see that it, it's, it's going off, but uh, yeah. I feel I'm, like I'm, I'm monitoring it. All right. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, maybe even inflaming it every once in a while. Oh, good. Good. 
Yeah, yeah. I feel like I'm playing a game on, on uh, I'm doing Twitch streaming and seeing comments pop up, but that's a, that's a different me. Um, so let's talk about uh, fair play now. This is uh, this is a game we've been we've been working on for a long time. I'm iterating that the first grant was NIH and came through in 2010, and we are actively working on it. Um, well, actually today. Um, so it's a game about implicit bias, and the lead center now at the Wisconsin Center for Education Research is sort of taking the reins. This, this grant and this work was originally done by Angela Byers Winston and Molly Carnes, two fantastic faculty. God, it's, a, it's amazing these people I've, I've been able to interact with, but the game was originally designed to um, be sort of an intervention for University of Wisconsin faculty. And the University of Wisconsin faculty are, are predominantly white. Um, I don't remember what the, what the gender uh, difference was, but the idea was that that implicit bias is not um, inherently, you know, racism, or it's not inherently bigotry, or people aren't aren't intending harm, but yet harm can still happen implicitly. And so the idea was that and they they did all kinds of research on uh, through these workshops with different faculty, and and now it's now grown. I know they they do they do talks out at, at Princeton, and, you know, UCI and UCLA and in Florida, all all over the place. Um, I think with with private organizations as well. Um, and it's really, it's really become, a, you know, a more effective, uh, you know, like PD, um, you know, I'm sure we've all been in these, you know, that whether it's sexual harassment training or it's inclusivity training, like all, all these different things. And to me, they're, they're not, I just think a lot more could be done. Um, and, and fair play really, really, really hits, hits well in this. Um, but like I'd mentioned before that the discussions, after the gameplay with these groups of people who don't know each other mostly, um, they're just, it's incredible. You never hear people talking about things like this. So can you, well, so it's interesting. I guess I'm thinking about a bunch of different things. One is um, I'm having a series of discussions with people that I know, um, especially this one individual, and we're recording them about race and bias. Um, and so one of, the, one of the points that he made is that, um, we are all probably the worst judges of our own bias because we don't know that we're biased unless we've been, unless we've been trained to, to, be, to recognize them. So that kind of a, was an interesting point that he made. Looking at this, what are some of the things that happen in the game about bias? Are you going to go over those? Um, I can go into some. Um, let's see here. Um, so this is a game you can play. So in the, in the, in the top here, what – I was afraid to get too deep into some of these games. I could, each of these games I could talk about for two hours. Um, but if you up at, the, up at the top, you can see where it says goals and then an almanac. The almanac will show you all these different uh, microaggressions, all these different, all these different things that can happen in this space. And so one example, so you play the role of Lucas. That's Lucas there you see in the green shirt. And Lucas is a grad student. And when Lucas first shows up at this university, he's in this sort of professional social setting and a, I think, I think it's a faculty person comes up and asks them if they have any more of a certain beverage in the back. And while they probably didn't mean any, you know, offense, they're assuming that because he looks the way he does, if he's not a student, he works there. Um, so those types of things where, you know, you'll, you'll see people have these, these really strong reactions sometimes. Well, I would never do that. I, I would, there's not a thing I would do. Um, but then, as the discussion unfolds, people start to share, well, I, I saw this happen one time, or this happened to a friend, or that, and even, even getting these groups of people to acknowledge or be aware that, that things like this can happen really starts making an impact. It, it's, it's profound. Um, and there might be a couple of other examples, but this game is available online. If you go to fairplaygame.org, um, you can mm -hmm. see it. Um, and that, but the, Boy, we've iterated a lot. It's a very, I mean, you can imagine, it it's, can be a very charged issue. And so we have to be very careful that we're not, that the game doesn't come across as accusatory or saying you're a, you're a bad person because of these things. We're, we're simply trying to look through the eyes of Lucas, the grad, or uh, um, Jamal, sorry, the, 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 the graduate student, and just learn from his experiences. And it sounds like the game had an effect on you as well. Oh, it did. It, it, it changed Gosh, every, every project that I've worked on has changed me to, to some degree. Um, this one, this one, a lot. Um, it it's helped me understand that 
you know, I can have a bias about anything, flavors, mm-hmm. ice cream, weather, it doesn't matter what it is. And so the idea that I may and, and do have implicit, you know, biases about other things, people, genders, heights, weights, these, these are real things. And it's helped me understand who I am. I'm, I'm definitely, you know, more careful about how I engage and even think about, about people. It, it, it's definitely impacted me for sure. Um, um, so when we talk about what, what sort of takeaways we want from the gameplay experience, um, to acknowledge that implicit bias exists <laughs> every, every day, I, you know, you'll see something that, you know, this, this crazy pseudoscience or, or crazy misinformation that, that, well, implicit bias aren't real. And are, there's, there's lots of pushback in the space. It's, it's kind of crazy, but um, anyway, so just understanding from a, you know, a, an, an academic evidence-based set of knowledge is in this game and it, you know, it's there. You can, you can read it. We, you can get into papers, all kinds of things from, from the game itself. Um, but really, you know, why do implicit bias, biases exist? We want players to be, to be asking us and think about this. And then, and then what can you do about it? And that's where you really start to get into that behavior change. And do you learn to recognize implicit biases that aren't specifically mentioned in the game? Is it, it can be more generalized or you, is it primarily focused on the implicit biases um, like asking the black guy to get the coffee or the woman to get the donuts or, you know, mm-hmm. things like that, that some people wouldn't have known were biases unless it was, but anyhow, is it, is it for those specific, the specific ones that are brought up or do you, is, is there ability to generalize? Um, so, so the game, it's a, it's a mission based or sort of, sort of quest based linear progression. So it is, it really gets to specifically what we've designed in the game. Um, but in the almanac, you're able to, to look at other examples of, of these types of, of biases, other, other impacts. Um, it, there's, there's a lot, a lot of information in this right. game. Uh, and, uh, and a couple questions about how is it, is it developed in Unity? Is it, 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 it yep. seems to be web-based, but okay. It is. So, well, it's actually, it's, it's available on a web. And most recently we, we built it out for iPads. Um, we did a, a really, really fun talk at South by Southwest last year and went down and because of network functionality, other things, what we did is we, we, we hard loaded it onto these iPads and distributed the iPads to the, to the workshop and people played the game that way. Mm. Um, but all of our, all of our projects right now are done in unity and uh, the, this has gone through several rounds of funding, but, but mainly NIH at, at one point it was a, an IPERT grant um, and then just some internal university of Wisconsin funding. Um, but it's uh it, it's it's quite a game. I'm I'm incredibly proud of all the work um, that's been done on this thing. And I'll go back to the measurement again on this one. Have you seen afterwards people who um, went through the simulation or went through fair play, and uh, sometime afterwards you could see that their behavior had changed? No, to to my knowledge, to, to date, they haven't been able to get funding for a longitudinal study like this. And that, that's one of the big big problems that you're going to see. So, but the data we have through how people are playing the game and then the, the data that we have through these discussion groups, I think sometimes there are, uh, you know, interviews uh, much later, but, but uh, we're, we're a little more removed from the, the research side of this. It's in another entity. Mm-hmm. Um, we, you know, we, we check in and we, we see how things are going, but, um, but you know, this isn't an, an inherent problem to this space. You know, like I mentioned, right. it, I can't necessarily track Professor Z for the next five years and see, you know, is there some sort of incident or not? It's, it's, it's very, very complex um, and be, would be quite expensive. Um, um, oh, here are a couple of other um, images here. Uh, here we have, uh, you know, Jamal, but th- this is explaining that, that even if you're not, you know, acting in a, in a prejudice or racist way, you know, the, the effects can still be devastating. Um, and, and the game is, it's, it's very soft in that it, um, you know, acknowledges that, that most people, you know, have personal values that, that are not racist or, or prejudiced. Um, but, but we grow up in, 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 you know, culture, just, you know, stereotypes everywhere. Um, Um, now we'll move into to crystals of Kador if there are any more questions in that space. Um, 
this was a, a career changing uh, game for me. Um, uh, Richie Davidson, a cognitive neuroscientist at UW, worked with him and his, and his team. And they're actually probably three or four different PIs on this. This is a billion. Actually, so just going back to this, this is a really good comment from David Wilson. And the, you know, so the question is, there's a, there's an implicit associate test of bias. And I, just like, as soon as he posted, it's like, well, you can give that test both before and after, right? Uh, you can, I think that, so that, that isn't, like I said, that, that research is being done by, uh, by, right. by Mary and Angela. Um, and I, I try not to get too much into the, the research side of it myself. Um, we do actually, we end up informing it and we, and we talk quite a bit. Um, but my understanding was that the IAT, um, which we all did lots of times uh, before building the game, you know, that there are possibly some inherent problems with the IAT. And then um, even if you did a, a pre and a post, you're, you're not necessarily going to see you know, if you did a post after six months, a post after eight months, a post after, you know, two years, three years, you know, maybe, I, you know, I don't know. That's, I'll leave that to the, um, the, the, the folks researching the, the, the learning outcomes, really. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but it, it's a, a very good question. And yeah, the IAT was actually quite shocking for me. Um, but uh uh, uh, so Crystal Decatur uh, was uh, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, Richie Davidson was the was the lead PI, and and th this this was a, a massive undertaking. There there must have been I don't know twenty five or so subject matter experts, anywhere from faculty to graduate students, um, even some even some Buddhist monks. Um, but uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, they were very interested in academic tenacity, and I, and I believe still are. But in 2012, 2013, they were wanting to know that, you know, they were wanting research, funding research in the spaces of pro-social behaviors and, and what are those impacts in academic spaces. And we, we started off, and I, I'll try to cut this a little shorter, but I, I could talk about this game forever. Um, uh, we... In building this game, it was very exciting because what the goal was to have players play this game on tablets, and the players were specifically thirteen-year-olds, and they were they would play the game, or they would have an fMRI, a physical scan of their brain, uh, in these big machines, and they would play the game. It would be scanned um, pre and post there, and looking for different levels of activity after a certain <laughs> dosage of gameplay, and uh, skip, skipping ahead just a little bit here, um, there's a bunch of published research here. Uh, Nature magazines that in, in the Journal of Science, and you can uh, look this up. But uh, the the summary here is that the, the game designed to train empathy, you know, in middle schoolers can produce behaviorally relevant changes in the brain in as little as two weeks. Um, so this 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 game changed how I think about behavior changing games quite a bit. And the fact that they measured it physically in the brains of these kids was still blows my mind. Um, but the, the design of the game, boy, it took just, you know, months and months and months to even get this thing off the ground. And, and you know, what we're going to look at, we're going to look at humans. And so we ended up creating these, these 3D aliens, these plant like aliens, like you can see on the screen there. And even how the, the interface there and choosing your emotion, um, the position of the different emotions, anger, happy, surprise, fear, sadness, disgust, what's across from one emotion, um, all of that mattered and all of that impacted the, the gameplay. Um, but what we wanted players to know is that human emotions are universal and how we display the emotions matters. And then how do we respond to the emotions of others? And we wanted to get this all through this, this very rich gameplay experience. So we created this, this big 3D world what you're seeing is part of the, the interface here. On the left, um, you use the slider interface, it's that little round circle by the number five there. And as, the, as this 3D model, this alien emotes in this 30 second loop, you move the slider up for 10 if it's high intensity emotion you're seeing and low intensity. And there's a bunch of research that talks about paying attention to, to faces. I don't, I'm not gonna go into all of that right now, but all of this is, is, has empirical evidence backing how this works. And so causing the player to focus on the peaks of the emotion, they start to understand 
um, the emotion. Then they, then they choose what emotion they think this is. Is it anger? Is it surprise? Um, then one of the next step is how do you respond? And we did a lot of work with, uh, there's a guy named Matthew Ricard, uh, and he's a Buddhist monk, and I think a molecular geneticist from France. And he's, he studies happiness. He studies emotions, and he, he has multiple books out. And we got, to, we got a little one-on-one -on -one time with him, uh, multiple occasions, actually. Um, turns out he, he plays a lot of games, which was surprising to me. But uh, embracing that there is no right way to respond to any emotion um, we sort of had to create these very strange and you can't, there's no images of the, of the robot that you, you play the role of a robot moving around in this, in this world with aliens and you have to try to understand what's going on with them so you can help them. But uh, the way that you respond, the little, the little sort of emoji looking things you see on the right, that's the silhouette of the alien or the robot's head. And then you can display digitally a response. And so it was interesting to see how, how students were responding to the emotion, no matter what it is. You know, in some instances, it might be appropriate to respond to sadness with, with laughter or with, you know, trying to cheer someone up. There's a, a limitless combinations. But um, this, this was a particularly interesting, interesting project. And I would suspect that this was not a trivial game to develop. So, so, <laughs> you, so you know, like, yeah, I'm thinking even millions of dollars to develop something like this. Uh, the, the initial grant, I think, was, I think it was one to two million in that range. Uh, at, at that time in my career, I wasn't involved in, in that level. I was more on the ground, really, really designing, playtesting. Um, so I, I wasn't fully aware of, this, of, the, of the cost, but I, but I can tell you that it, it fully funded a 12-person development team for about a year and a half. Um, so that's probably around, you know, probably 1.5 to, to 2 million. Um, and and it, this is all done in Unity. And so at the time, getting into some of the technical things, Unity didn't have a good facial capture, facial animation system. There wasn't anything that really worked well. So we wrote our own from scratch, uh, thanks to a very talented, uh, um, very talented artist and programmer, a guy named Adam Weens, who's now a, uh, um, a professional glass blower in, in Asheville. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, a, a very, very complex game. Um, and then just knowing the, the impact that this game had and the level in which I was given access to work with the, the, the faculty and staff really just, just changed. You know, at this point, it was roughly five years into my game to game, learning game design career. You know, I decided there, there was a lot here. And so that, that really pushed me forward in my, in my career quite a bit. Um, just a, a fantastic experience and some, some solid measurement. Now, what happens with those kids two years from now, three years from now? I, I don't think that's being tracked. And I know we're about to go to an, another game, but what about, you know, as you're developing these games, how do you consider uh, people with different, would say, disabilities? Uh, so early on, we didn't, we didn't actually do much. Um, I had a, I was doing, I was talking at an Atlantic conference in DC, would have been 2014 or 2015, and a, a very nice gentleman stood up, older guy, and in the middle of this, in the middle of this talk and asked, you know, he, he was the president of the American Council for the Blind. Mm -hmm. He's like, what are you, what are you doing for me? He's like, if, if games are, you know, you know, the future of education or, you know, if games are going to become more and more prevalent, you know, what are we going to do here? And it just, you know, I'm, you know, I'm standing up there on the stage. I'm just kind of like, uh, uh, that, that had a pretty, pretty profound right. impact on me. Um, uh, so it I'll, seems to me there might've been some implicit bias there. <laughs> Possibly. Uh, but what that did cause is so, so now, um, now that we're, we're at the University of Wisconsin, the University of Wisconsin has this McBurney Center. They, they're the group responsible for making everything accessible. Um, we've actually been doing a lot of work in that. Um, one of our, it's a, it's a game I'm not showing today, but one of, the, one of our newest games is um, a game uh, we did in partnership with McGraw-Hill Education. And it is a game that is fully accessible. It um, has all kinds of things, everything from screen reader technology to different sets of controls, pacing, all, all kinds of stuff. Um, and that's a game, 
uh, you can contact me if you're, if you're interested in that. But that game is. Well, and I'll tell you, uh, Teresa uh, Divine posted in the chat a link to Game Accessible Guidelines, which is which is also a great source. There, there are so there. So be careful where you where you go for that. There's there's a whole bunch. So the one of the most prevalent um, official sources right now is actually uh, for web. I think it's called like w WCAG 2.0. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it, it's it talks about web based games and how the internet it, it it's it's much more that it's much less into games um, so what we had to do a, we, that we use that for sort of a guideline but we pulled from probably 10 or 15 different sources and sort of tried to compile information see what we thought was good what was going to work but given that games can take many many forms not all of these sort of interventions or things that you can implement are, are going to even work mm -hmm. at all right um, um, so so you have to really be be very creative and you know, surprisingly, people have really, really just come out of the woodwork offering to help us, you know, people that may be, you know, physically impaired in some way, um, just, just to try to help us understand, because it is very difficult to think about designing a game for some of these impairments that I, I truly just don't understand. And I'm looking at the time, because it's, we've gone an hour, and you haven't even covered the, the last game, so <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Maybe can we can we advance the last game because this is one of the games that actually we could try out, right? Yeah, let me let me blast through this real quick. So, um, Med Smart Adventures in Pharma City. This was done in uh, in partnership with the University of Wisconsin School of Pharmacy. Uh, we worked with a, a really awesome faculty there. Her name was uh, um, Olafu Malola uh, Abraham. And she's she's just she's really fantastic. A very big bad, big advocate of games. Uh, so all of what you see here was done in partnership with her. Um, but basically what we did is we, we really engaged with human centered design and talked to kids. She, she did all this, all this work on this literature, trying to figure out what we needed to do these eight core principles. Um, I came up with this game mechanic where we have sort of this groundhog's day loop where you have this golden path. You have to go back through and keep playing the game until you um, get it right. Um, we wanted people to know, um, you know, the, these, these kids primarily, it was young adults, uh, I think I think middle school up to, to high school, but that at some point you may be responsible for medication. Um, we wanted to try to model and show what good practices and behaviors are, and then also what are some of the consequences of, of bad practices and behaviors. Um, for example, on the left there, you can see, you know, a parent leaves medication out on the kitchen counter. You know, what are your friends going to do? In this particular instance, you turn around to get them something to drink, you know, they they take the pills. Um, you know, the, these are all scenarios that, like I said, we these are real world scenarios that we, where we talk with people about. Um, and also on, on the right there, you know, a kid in school, misinformation and misunderstandings about medications can have some really serious consequences. Um, your player character is, is giving a persuasive, persuasive speech uh, in the game. And as you go up to do the speech, your, your friend tells you, hey, take one of these, it'll relax you. Turns out that it's a, a powerful opioid. You get up there, you're impaired. You know, all kinds of things start to go wrong in your life. Um, and so it's it's really this um, very cartoony, very relaxed art style. But this was a, a really low budget, very uh, this is like a first iteration prototype. What do you mean by low budget? Uh, that means different things for different people. <laughs> so so this whole thing um, in in studio time, it, it's, it was just under uh, fifty thousand dollars, I think. Wow. Um, so that so this whole thing was done. It's 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 not a ton of gameplay. We're 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 just getting to the testing stage and, and looking for additional funding to to further it. Now I do know um, now for those of you spe specifically interested in this, um, I can pass your information on to um, uh, the School of Pharmacy faculty. But I know that there's there is a plan to try to come up with a longitudinal study around this type of game place game based learning where looking at potentially, you know, hospital records, you know, uh, law enforcement records, things like that, tracking specific students, longitudinal like that. I am not part of that at all. I know that those are, those are some of the ideas that we had talking about this early on, but there's very much an interest in knowing exactly what is working and what, and what isn't in this space and in this game. Um, I also want to say that this is also a, a scary subject in, in some ways, because what we don't want to do is introduce a bad behavior that wasn't known, right? But could cause problems. So it's so it's really it's a it's a pretty fine line here. And we're all the faculty, the designers, the artists, we're all very aware of that. And so 
I'm, I'm very interested to see where this where this game goes in the future. Um, and we can we can get a, a a link to to play that game. Just feel free to to contact me. Well, and if you can put a link into the slides, I'll be posting the slides on the archives page along okay. with the along with um, the video archive. So that's Great. another way that people can access it. Wonderful. Well, uh, yeah. So in in conclusion, so there is no easy answer here. There there's no magic bullet. It's very very difficult to to study this longitudinally. Incredibly expensive. I. I know, I know things like this have been done, but uh, I don't think with it with a game at the heart of it. Um, but designing for behavior, behavior change is challenging, no matter which of the, you know, it seems like there are about 500 different models and frameworks out there. But I do know that games can be helpful in this space. Um, and do you ever take the the, uh, the games and kind of in, and integrate them into, say, a learning management system, um, both from a point of assigning the game and maybe the two-way communication so that the data for, uh, of student usage from the game goes to the LMS or the student information system. Yep. Yeah. So, so we do have that with, uh, with at play in the cosmos, which is a game owned by WW Norton and it works on their learning management system through LTI mm -hmm. and then our McGraw Hill education game that, that's just come out uh, journey through the lifespans um, that works on their LMS. Different schools that use different LMSs have, they'd, they'd have to be a third party agreement to allow student data to be merged in the in these certain other areas. I know for the University of Wisconsin, for example, they want everything moved over to Canvas. Um, what, right, but it, but, okay, so, but you, you, you could do LTI. Oh, yeah. For example, right. All, all of that is, it's being done right now. I think with mm -hmm. the at play in the Cosmos game uh, with WW Norton, I think, I think over, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, um, Rob Bellinger, fantastic person over there. He's, uh, I think he just told me that it's something like, getting close to 25,000 students have been graded through, through an LMS um, wow. for, for an introduced astronomy class, just, just in that game. It's only been out a couple of years. Um, and your contact information, because people are putting, posting their contact information here, but maybe easier for them to get, you, you have a slide where you have your contact information? I do. I, I just wanted to share some, some breaking news. Um, <laughs> this is a pretty big deal. So I'm, I'm very nervous, but I'm very excited. You're learning. Um, we're going to be spinning out a private company and no longer at the University of Wisconsin uh, following the summer semester. Wow! Congratulations. That is that's yeah. great. Yeah, thank you. It's and it's it's amicable. It's uh, we we still want to have very very close ties with the university. We're still working with lots of faculty and staff there, um, but we're we're also actively looking for for partnerships and opportunities. And uh, we're right now all, what we're doing is we're sorting out all the, all the IP and whatnot. But it's 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 been a very smooth process, um, and please feel free to reach out to me at, uh, at mike at gearlearning.org. I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, so the people who wanted to get access to the games or wanted more information, uh, this is Mike's email, and this is, would be how do you get, you get in touch with Mike at gearlearning.org. Yes. Uh, uh, so, so what would you, so if somebody were thinking about modifying behavior and were thinking in terms of a game, um, and said, "Well, you know, you've done this before. What are what are three or what are three things that I should really consider?" Um, you really need to know your audience. You really, really need to know what are they doing, and really, you know, taking a step back from the game, making sure that that the behavior change that you're looking for is possible. You know. Giant leaps may not be possible. And then figuring out, like I said, in looking at what are these, what are the barriers to the behavior change? If it's, if it's something that's really like a deep value, forget it. You're not, you're not changing anything. Um, at least it's not quickly. Right. Okay. So number one would be knowing your audience. Number yep. two, understanding the barriers that are kind of affecting people that are causing them to do this and, and not to do what you want to. So that's two. Um, and then making sure that the mapping of the mechanics to the outcomes that you want is done well. If you, if you don't, I mean, I, I mean, just by a show of hands, I'm sure it'll be hundred percent. How many of you have played a really, really bad educational game? I'm sure that's for long. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, there's a lot of bad stuff out there. And with all of the media and stuff, the, one of the main reasons that we're, that we're spinning out this, this private group is we want to be easier to work with in this space and we want this to be done right. Um, you know, you, big universities have tremendous overheads, <laughs> which makes costs go just through the roof. And, you know, we know this stuff is expensive, but if you don't do it right, 
you're just, you're just going to cause problems. So, so do it right. Make sure the behavior is, is achievable. And then really we do it right. You mean like make the game fun, M make the game fun and make sure you're, it's very easy to design a game wanting people to learn math, but what they end up doing is hating math. It's, it's very easy to, to have a, have the wrong outcome. Very easy. In fact, I, I would argue that, you know, 60 to 70 percent of educational games have drastic unintended consequences i would say that's a very conservative estimate <laughs> um and so it's just it's taken it's, it's just this sort of school of hard knocks we we've been through it we've certainly had massive failures but we really know how to how to get it done the right way and to do that mapping and may, if, if it's private companies make sure you're pairing with with the right academics Make sure you're you're getting the right information, not not the cheapest bidder. I mean, hardworking, really really smart faculty are not easy to come by, um, and they're they're worth a billion times their weight in gold. One of the questions, because I sometimes forget that you know we're steeped in games all the time, but some you know, uh, a person was asking, well, what do you mean by the word game mechanics? Ah, game mechanics. So, boy, it could be a, a bunch of different things. So if whatever the choice the player is making in the game, if it's left or right or up or down or, or choosing to, to sell a drug or to not sell a drug, whatever these things are, the, the, core, the core underlying systems that, that I can affect, if those systems are properly mapped to a certain rule set or a certain um, you know, pedagogy, you can have really fantastic outcomes. That's going all the way back to see if I can blast it back. So rewards and punishment may be part of a game mechanic or yeah. um, the ability to accumulate points might be part of a game mechanic or uh, the ability to, I don't know, kill an opponent, an opponent um, or to compete. Those are all parts of game mechanics. Yeah. So if you, so it's, it's why you're doing something in the game. What is the outcome you're expecting? You know, are you, are you leveraging? Are you, are you choosing between two things? Is it a, is it a path choice? I mean, there are, in any given game, there, I mean, there are tons of them. Um, and choice, choice is key to a game being engaging and fun, feeling like you have some ownership over that experience. But mm -hmm. knowing that you could put a million different flavors in here, you want the flavor that's going to lead to a specific outcome. Um, and it's, I mean, I can, I'm happy to, to right. go into No, there's some good, yep. No, I think you got it. And there's been some really good um, uh, suggestions in the chat also. Um, so anyhow, so, uh, we went over, you know, three pieces of advice that you would give. Um, and you're going to be, you know, you're presenting a serious play, right? Yes. Yeah. I think I'm doing, I think Sue talked me into three talks, I think. <laughs> okay. So, so if you like Mike here, you'll love him on serious play. So come and sign up for the serious play conference and join us there. Um, so yeah, and we, we went 15 minutes over. I hope people d didn't mind. There's still a lot of people on even, even 15 minutes late. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this thank has been very informative. Um, very, very valuable information. The comments are coming through. You were, you're a rock star. We, <laughs> I had, I, I have a subscription that has up to 90, up to a hundred people. We had 98 people on the uh, on this at one point you know for quite a while so um so that's pretty amazing um so anyhow thank you very much and i'll see you online and i'll follow your progress um you know uh as you as you privatize and i'm happy to talk more about how we skill your games and in, in education wonderful thanks Dan. Okay. yeah please don't be afraid to reach out i will respond okay all right have a good afternoon everybody hope to see you at future events mitch weisberg signing off have a good day bye